day. Here we are. As you know, today is Earth Day. To this day, Americans celebrate our glorious natural heritage and renew our pledge to care for God's creation. <coughs> On this day, the president is having a virtual meeting with leaders of 40 countries to address the climate crisis. Today, the president has taken historic transformative action by announcing bold the bold pledge that America will cut our carbon pollution in half by 2030. To put this in perspective, President Obama committed to a 25% pollution reduction by 2025 in the Paris Agreement. President Biden, and it is anticipated that we'll reach that goal, and now President Biden is doubling uh, that cut in five more years to 3030. I think I've got a lot of stuff here. <laughs> um, in order to do that, we need the American Jobs Plan. When any of us, uh, starting with President Biden, talk about climate, and you hear the president say this all the time, when I think about climate crisis, I think of one word, jobs. Jobs. Well, our, char our chairs are advancing American Jobs Act, which will, we hope will be bipartisan. Millions of workers are in need of a good-paying job while our infrastructure is crumbling. Despite being the wealthiest country, we rank 13th globally in the quality of our infrastructure. You know the figures that the, the poor grades that the American Society of Civil Engineers gives us on the condition of our infrastructure. Now is the time for a once-in-the-century investment to create millions of good-paying jobs ensure Americans can compete with any country in the world and pave the way for economic growth for years to come. I say once in a century. It's early in the century. I'm sure others will have maybe something even bigger down the road, uh, way down the road. To build back uh, better, today is important as, uh, as a part of uh, the For the People agenda. We reintroduced the powerful Drug, Drug Price Reduction Act of uh, the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug pr Cost Now, in honor of our dear Elijah. This is about families. You've heard me say again and again that when we're out on the campaign trail or in Zooms and the rest, this is the, the cost of health care, especially prescription drugs, is debilitating for families. I've seen grown men cry because they just cannot meet the obligations that they have uh, for their families if they have someone in drastic need of drugs on an ongoing basis. So that it, it, when we did the Affordable Care Act, it was essential because we could not sustain the cost of health care. It was unsustainable to individuals, to families, to small businesses, to corporate America, to the taxpayer. And one of the successes of the Affordable Care Act was to decrease the rate of increase of, of health care costs which we succeeded in doing except for one thing, the cost of prescription drugs. And that's why we have been trying again and again to have legislation passed that enables the secretary to, re to negotiate for lower drug prices. In the beginning when we started, it was about Medicare drug prices, but then in this legislation, it's about all drug prices. It is unacceptable that Americans have to pay three times more for prescription drugs for the very same drugs that are sold one-third of the cost overseas. Millions of Americans, as I say, cannot afford their medicines, particularly during the pandemic, where profits have soared uh, for the pharmaceutical companies. Also this week, in the Florida People Agenda, we have legislation on the floor. This morning, we are passing H.R. 51. Some of you were with us yesterday when we talked about that with Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, to secure statehood for the District of Columbia, for Washington, D.C., whose, uh, whose residents pay taxes, fight in our wars, power our economy, yet do not have a full voice in our democracy. Yesterday, uh, we passed two bills, a no-ban act, a real cause for celebration to get rid of that uh, act of discrimination, and uh, the Access to Counsel Act rejecting xenophobia and discrimination on the basis of religion, and reaffirming that all people, including immigrants, are entitled to civil rights, civil liberty, and dignity 
access to counsel. Finally, but before I go on about the District of Columbia, let me just uh, talk about this. I said yesterday when I was here, because Denny was talking about his history of how long he was going back, and this one, this I, how far they went back on this issue, and I said this District of Columbia statehood is in my DNA. And I bring you this picture. I mentioned it yesterday. I said, come to my office and see it. But until COVID enables you to do that, I, d I brought it here. This is a picture. This is a picture of my father and the first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. It was the first time he had a hearing as the chair of the District of Columbia Appropriations Subcommittee. As chair of that committee, he was known as the unofficial mayor of Washington because, sadly, the Congress had so much say over the... Uh, what happened in the District of Columbia. He did not uh, support that. He was all for home rule and what would come after that. But this was an invitation he extended to Eleanor Roosevelt, and she, as I said, was the first First Lady to ever testify in Congress. And she testified about the uh, conditions in St. Elizabeth uh, welfare uh, institutions in the District of Columbia. And this is the picture that was taken. We're so proud of it. And again, proud that to help, but help meant make, letting the District of Columbia decide for itself. So as, as, as everybody talks about how long they've been working on it, DNA, District of Columbia, statehood. So that was then. This is now. Next week, we celebrate 100 days of the Biden-Harris administration. At that time, with the American Rescue Plan and Pre President Biden's actions, we have made extraordinary progress in crushing the virus and recovering from the economic crisis. Yesterday, we reached the milestone. Our country reached the milestone of administering 200 million shots and on in under 100 days. As we said in the rescue package, vaccines in the arms, money in the pockets, children in school, people at work. Now, 100, President, first he said 100 sh shots in 100 days, and then the success was so great that it's, he succeeded 200 shots in less, than one, in less than 100 days. Half of the adults have at least one dose, over 80% of seniors have had their first dose, up to 8% when President, it went from 8% when he took office of seniors having their first shot to 80% of seniors having their first shot now. In the first month of the administration, also 80% of educators and school staff have received their first dose. dose many are now fully uh, vaccinated. This was quite an eventful week in many ways. In terms of the verdict in the Derek Chauvin murder trial, I want to salute our colleague, Representative Karen Bass, Madam Chair, for her tremendous work on the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. Last year, May 25th, was a horrible day that we saw George Floyd murdered before our very eyes. By June 8th, the House introduced the Justice in Policing Act under Karen Bass's leadership. Soon after, in a hearing that would come up before it could come to the floor, we had a hearing, the family was here. They asked me, they said, Madam Speaker, can this bill be named for our brother and for our, his daughter to know that his life mattered? And I said, if you think the bill is worthy of George Floyd, we will name it for him. Let's, the bill, survived the committee process, passed on the floor on June 25th, one month from the day of the assassination. And on March 3rd of this year, we passed the bill again. We know that this bill must be done. It must be enacted into law. And again, I want to salute Karen Bass for her ongoing efforts from the start to, to write a bill, working with all of the uh, interested parties as stakeholders in all of this, and then um, 
again, now trying to reach consensus with the Senate. She is optimistic. She is fair-minded. She is open. And hopefully she will be successful in having a meaningful George Floyd Justice in Policing Act. We couldn't, I'm just so proud of the work that she has done. She's been working on these issues for years, as has our Black Caucus. That's why they were so ready. They were so ready to, uh, when this happened, to have a bill ready by just the second week in June and on the floor and passed by one month uh, since the most unfortunate tragedy. Any questions? You got? Madam Speaker, um, if we could get an update on the 1 6 Commission, we know that you said that you're yeah. going to equal number of Republicans and Democrats and then equal subpoena power, but your Republican counterparts have said that they have not received your proposal yeah. yet. Have you extended that offer to them, and, and what other parts of the proposal do you hope to change? And what, just in general, what is the state of the Well, here, there are three things in terms of the legislation the makeup of the commission. Uh, the uh, process within the commission and the scope of the commission. Two objections that the Republicans had was that they wanted to have it even instead of the president having an appointment, just to have it, the House, the Democrats and Republicans, and we yielded on that. I think the president should have it, but nonetheless, the scope is what is important. If that's where their discomfort is, I yield on, uh, not I, we uh, yield on that. The second part was on process where they had a concern about subpoena, the subpoena power. Uh, we have said that we would agree to the subpoena power that I think they would agree to, that is, that the chair and the ranking, the, not the ranking member, the chair and the vice chair would um, have to agree on a subpoena or a majority of the committee, uh, of the commission agree. That seems to address the uh, subpoena. Uh, we'll see. We still don't know where they will be on scope. But a num some of this is, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, interaction among members on committees, et cetera. And if, if we can come to agreement on scope, uh, the uh, the first two, well, why would they object to the scope, which is to find the truth of what happened on January 6th when an insurrection descended upon the Capitol, Viol just, well, I don't need to describe it to you, but it, our purpose is to find the truth for that. It's not about investigating one thing or another that they may want to draw into this. But I'm optimistic. Again, there are other options which I would not want to use uh, because I want this to be bipartisan. And again, if, if the price of the confidence that the public would have in this is to uh, make it a little harder to get some things done, so be it. But we have to agree on the scope. But, you, but Republicans say they haven't heard from you yet. Have you... Well, some Republicans have, but that, don't, don't you worry about that. Don't you worry about that. Uh, the uh, one step at a time in terms of you okay with the pro with the um, subpoena? You okay with the? Uh, then we will have. Now we put out our proposal uh, a, a few weeks ago. I didn't see anybody write it up at all. I mean, it was like, oh, nothing's happening. No, things were happening. It's a process. It's a process. What is your objection? How can we find common ground? Because at the end of the day, you weigh the equities. It's not about specific that you weigh the equities. Is this a path to the truth? And that's what we'll find out. And I'm optimistic that we can. As I've said, the scope means so much that it's important to yield. And I listen to my members, too. That is to say, our chairman, Benny Thompson, of the Homeland Security Committee, is Folk, as he has been focused for a long time on domestic terrorism. A long time, all through the, the previous administration, this has been a focus of his, and or even longer in his role as chair of the Homeland Security Committee. So I take my some of my lead from him and other members about 
what the, what the weighing of equities will get us in seeking the truth. But I think it's very important. And you know the provenance. I had the bill in 2001. Uh, I, I, had, I was author of the legislation for the commission then. So we all have a, a great deal of experience in terms of the makeup, the process, the who, you know, and who, and how is that defined? Uh, the numbers, yeah, but also who are these people? The, the process, timetable, resources for it, and, but most important, the purpose, the scope. Madam, yes, sir. Yes, good morning. Thank you. What do you got? So obviously, the D.C. bill will face a challenge in the Senate because of the filibuster and all. You guys have passed a lot of bills here, including later today the D.C. statehood bill, that are piling up in the Senate. You and many of your fellow Democrats were critical of Mitch McConnell being unable to move bills, or being unwilling, frankly, to move bills there. But isn't the same phenomenon happening there, and therefore should they, should they get rid of the filibuster? Well, uh... You realize that uh, Mitch McConnell is still the problem. <laughs> it's not as if it was Mitch McConnell, now it's somebody else. No, Mitch McConnell is still the problem. And uh, the, uh, I don't get involved in any discussion on Senate rules. You know that. And I don't welcome any discussion from them on House rules. However, uh, I do think we have discussion on issues and how they, uh, the, American, the needs of the American people are met. Uh, we think our For the People agenda with the... Uh, uh, the, the H.R. 1 to cl for cleaner government and cleaner politics in our country is very important. We think H.R. 3 to lower the cost of prescription drugs. We think that, that H.R. 4, the Voting Rights Act, is something that uh, is, shouldn't be blocked because of process. The list goes on. H.R. 5, the Equality Act. Uh, H.R. 6, Dreamers and... and um, uh, and, and the Promise Act that goes with that, H.R. 7, equal, fair, fair Pay Act, uh, uh, um, Equal Pay for Equal Work, H.R. 8, Background Check Legislation, as well as 1446 that goes with that, the South, uh, South Carolina loophole, uh, then H.R. 9, Protect the Planet Now, and of course we'll go back to H.R. 2, which was our for the uh, moving America forward, the jobs bill that we are hopefully working on, which we may, I wish, I hope we can do the bills without reconciliation, that we won't have bipartisanship. But uh, should we not have any progress on all of these fronts because of that? Well, that's a debate for the Senate. And isn't that a political problem that you face then? If, if you're moving these bills and they're stalled in the Senate for whatever reason, isn't the, situ the outcome basically the same as what you had when the Republicans were in the majority next year? Well, let's see what the Senate does. Go ask them. Go ask them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Are you supportive of Congresswoman Bass formally negotiating with Republicans yes. to try to come to a compromise? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I, I have briefed by her. I mean, the, again, the Black Caucus has been on this case for a long time. And so the provisions in the bill about chokeholds, about... Uh, no knock mandate. All of all of the provisions have been issues they have discussed for a long time, and they were ready. They were ready. And again, we have to. We cannot not uh, improve the situation. And, and so, yes, I do. Uh, we couldn't be better served. She knows what our purpose is for all of us. She knows the particulars. When she wrote this bill, she was at that time still the chair of the crime subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, she had a waiver to do two, one foreign affairs, one judiciary. Uh, and uh, so that's, she wrote it under that auspices, inspired by a tradition in the Black Caucus of having justice in policing, hence the name. And then, yes, uh, so she has our full support. And I wish that you all would use her name more because it is synonymous with justice. She is fair. She wants to get it done. This isn't uh, uh, any... It's the, uh, the responsible res prioritizing for accountability and justice. Yes, sir? I wonder if you, on the police issue, uh, Kim Scott said yesterday qualified immunity. He's looking to change that. Obviously, it's a big, a big piece of the police reform puzzle for Republicans. Right. He's suggesting that 
uh, change the standard to have people sue departments instead of police officers. Yeah. I wonder how you view that. He said Democrats that he's talked to have been receptive to that. Well, let me just say what I said earlier about other things. It's about the weighing the equities. Just to take one thing and say, would you do this or would you do that? It's weighing the equities. Uh, uh, qualified immunity is very important. Uh, the public list, listing, very important. If you agree that there should be a list, then why would it not be public? Chokeholds, that 100%, uh, again, no not... Uh, no knock warrants and that kind of thing. So the, I, I trust uh, Karen Bass's knowledge of the subject, but also her knowledge of the ramifications it would have on the people that we're trying to protect, which is everybody in our country, including our law enforcement officers. So um, I, I would, I, I trust her to keep on the table what, what can be accomplished. And uh, I don't think that I think everybody knows this has to be a serious bill that will make a difference. So that's why I trust uh, whatever they decide. Yeah. Okay. All right. What do you got? Last um, question. Speaker, two quick questions. Do you support the, state, the self determination for state bills, statehood bills for Puerto Rico? And two, Senator Ossoff says that you will be looking into allegations of sexual misconduct by members of Congress uh, against <laughs> night shift custodians who clean the Capitol complex. What is Congress's responsibility to protect the custodians who clean these buildings? Well, on the statehood issue, that's up to the people of Puerto Rico. That's up to them to decide whether they want to be a state, uh, and then we'll see what happens after that. I, I, I love Puerto Rico. I, I felt embarrassed by how President Trump withheld resources for them after natural disasters and the rest. Do you prefer one bill or the other, uh, the self-determination or, or statehood? No, I'm not for one bill, and it's up to the people of Puerto Rico to make a decision about their status. Uh, in terms of your second question, the chair of the House Administration Committee will be meeting with both the architect and the inspector general and, and we'll look forward to seeing the report on any progress in this area. Uh, we don't have any place here uh, for any question in terms of the safety in, in every sense of the word for our workers in the Capitol. Thank you all very much. Don't forget. 51st State, Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> Thomas D'Alessandro Jr. Is that wonderful? Isn't that something to be so proud of? The first, first lady in the, to come to testify before Congress. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye -bye.